Today we're going to be talking about the 10,000 hour rule. You know, the 10,000 hour rule. Do something for 10,000 hours and you'll be amazing at it. Play basketball for 10,000 hours. Join the NBA. Draw or paint for 10,000 hours. Sell at galleries. Does it really take 10,000 hours to gain mastery at something? Trish and I are going to talk about exactly that. The 10,000 hour rule. We're going to talk about where it came from. Does it apply to art? How does it apply to art? And does it really take 10,000 hours to be a really good artist? It is an absolutely beautiful day here in Arizona, and I am sitting here with my wife, Trisha Messenger, who's getting her master's degree in kinesiology. Um, kinesiology, for those who don't know, is the study of body movement. I realize that is a way oversimplification <laughs> of what she's doing and what she's studying, but it really does apply to the arts. And so today we're going to discuss the 10,000 hour rule the crazy number that a lot of people associate that you got to you got to do 10,000 hours before you're a competent artist and and what does that mean and how does that relate to what she is studying and then how does that relate to what we are doing so say hi to everybody Tracia hi everybody <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about the 10,000 hour rule cuz the one thing that that through your studies that I found that you said is that the person who originally came up would we quote coming up with a 10,000 hour rule really didn't and that he was kind of misquoted. Yeah. So the gentleman who did the original study uh, is Dr. K. Anders Erickson. And he was a psychologist and he was fascinated with expertise. What makes people who were amazingly good at something amazingly good. And so you got to remember, because he was a psychologist, he was looking at this from a different point of view. He wasn't looking at this from like a motor control point of view. He was just kind of like, what makes people experts? What makes people really good? So he studied uh, violinists, musicians, and um, he published this study and it was well received. And what happened next was that a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Gladwell read his study and decided to use it in uh, a book that he wrote. And he's the one who coined the term, the 10,000 hour rule. And Hmm. in his book, he states based on Erickson's research, but he didn't quite get it right. He kind of overgeneralized it. He stated that um, he's the one who gave it the name that it was the magic number for true expertise came at 10,000 hours. Hmm. And and so that was Malcolm. Right. That was Malcolm Gladwell. Not Erickson. Okay. And so then what did Erickson come up with then? (laughs) Okay. So over the years, what happened is, is that, you know, usually this is, this is part of what happens in academia. There's a little bit sometimes of tit for tat. If somebody is very well received, then other people come up and go, is it truly valid? Was the study truly valid? Right. And Mm -hmm. so people came in and they blew apart the study and, you know, it was like trying to, you know, invalidate his work. I, I will be very honest. I like Erickson's work and he's dead now. So I kind of feel like if I can help kind of straighten things out a little bit, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, he actually in 2014 wrote a response to all of his detractors. And he was the one who explained that it's like, look, I never said 10,000 hours. So what happened is, is that Gladwell wrote this book 
the 10,000 hour rule hit the internet and kind of took off and kind of developed a life of its own. And I remember when I was in art school, it was like, oh, you got to put in 10,000 hours. And it, and yeah, it seems so daunting when right. you hear that. And, you know, and it's one of those things where it's like when you hear that number, you think, oh my God, from college on, I have to produce 10,000 hours before I can even know my voice or feel like I have something to say with my art. It's like, that's a really long time. But one of the things that Erickson did when he did his study was that he was looking from, he was looking from practice from childhood on. So that's something to take into consideration is that it's not from the time that you're adult, an adult, it's from the time that you first start ex- exploring art. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he clarified um, in, in a rebuttal that he wrote to one of the articles was that a lot of, for example, because he was studying musicians and he was studying violinists in particular, it was like one of their four groups of expert violinists only averaged about 5,000 hours of practice. So let's, let's, can we, can we go into what Erickson study, can we talk about the violinists and what that study was? Sure. To give us some context. So Erickson was looking at was there a particular type of practice, right, mm-hmm. that created expertise, right? Was it just running scales all the time? Or, you know, was it what type of practice were people doing mm-hmm. that that gave them, that, that helped move them forward towards becoming an expert or having a tremendous skill? He dubbed it deliberate practice which okay. is you're not just sitting there doodling and you're not just sitting there, you know, as far as the art world is concerned. It's like you're not just running scales and and just doing the same thing all the time. Mm-hmm. That's not deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is where you're very focused and you're really trying to learn something. You are pushing yourself outside just on that other edge of your comfort zone. Okay, Mm -hmm. Daniel Coyle, who wrote the book Talent Code, um, which one of your listeners Mm -hmm. told you about. And so you listened to it and now I'm listening to it. Yeah, Mike did. Yeah, I love it. (laughs) Um, He has a slightly different name for it. He calls it deep practice. And I think in terms of when you're creating art, deep practice is probably a slightly more accurate term than deliberate practice. Because when Erickson talks about deliberate practice, he talks about uh, a teacher creating a structure for the student to follow. Okay? So it's like you have to work one-on-one with a teacher. Deliberate or and deep practice, which is Daniel Coyle's term, it's more self-engaged. It's not necessarily with a coach. Mm. It's where you hit a skill that you want to achieve and how you go about developing that skill. And so what Daniel Coyle talks about with deep practice, which I think is a little bit more relatable to what y'all do in art, is that you practice a part If it's not the way you want it, you go back, you try it a different way, and you keep playing with it until you get get that part of the skill to where you want it. Mm -hmm. Then you go forward to the next part of the skill. And so what you're doing is you're taking things in smaller segments, very small segments, and you're working those until you are happy with it, and then you take it to the next segment, and then you work the next segment. So it's... um, this goes into something, and we can talk about it. I don't know if it's appropriate for this conversation. Mm-hmm. But what it is is you're looking at a variable practice, so you're not making yourself do the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. You're taking it in a series, so it's one small segment at a time. You're working it a variety of ways until you find the way that clicks for you. And then once you have proficiency at that, 
then you go on to the next segment. Okay? Okay. So Daniel Coyle would say that what you're doing when you do that deep type of practice is that you're building um, myelin. You are building the sheath that wraps around the nerve endings so that they can fire quicker, more efficiently, and faster. Okay. Okay. I guess quicker and faster at the same So it's kind of like muscle memory at that point. It's motor memory. Motor motor memory. Motor memory, right? So one of the things to remember is that when you are drawing, drawing is a hand-eye coordination. Drawing is a fine motor skill. Painting is a fine motor skill. Mm -hmm. And this goes all the way back to what they call developmental kinesiology or how we build... Um, motor memory from the time that we are born. So like the very first thing that an infant does is what do they do? They do something that's called a palmar grasp, which is what do they do? They take their hand and they grab your finger. Mm -hmm. That's a motor skill. Right. Okay. And then every motor skill from that builds on those very, very basic, um, those very basic reflexes. The motor skill that's most associated with drawing and painting is a motor skill that's called a pincer grasp. And it's this ability and it's a sensitivity that comes through the fingers and the hands. So this is about nerve endings Mm -hmm. in the fingers and the hands. And it's that information that the fingers and the hands and the fingertips take back up to your brain so that then you can develop hand-eye coordination. Mm -hmm. So the way it works with a baby is that when they start their pincer grasp is that it's usually when they're eating and you put out a piece of cereal and they have to take their thumb and their index finger and they have to grab it so that then they can put it in their mouth. You're talking Cheerios. That's I'm, what talking I'm talking Cheerios, that's what I'm right? Talking this, yeah, Cheerios. it's like, and it works with blueberries and bananas <laughs> sure. and all that other good kind of stuff. But that's where it starts. It's this, it goes all the way back, everybody, it goes all the way back to learning how to eat with your fingers. <laughs> when you're a baby. When you're a baby, right? <laughs> so that's, they call that an inferior pincer grasp. And then what you do is the next step is to be able to make an okay sign. Mm-hmm. That's the superior or neat pincer grasp. And it's how delicately, how can you take small items and pick them up, mm-hmm. right? That All of that information coming from your fingertips and your hands goes into your brain and that informs your hand-eye coordination, mm-hmm. okay? We kind of really devolved off what we were going to talk about. I'm yeah, sorry. I want to go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I just got really excited because hand so the thing to remember is that when you're when you're drawing and when you're painting and you're moving into that deep practice, right? Part of what you are building is hand eye coordination. Mm-hmm. And one of the toughest things, at least that I used to come up against when I was painting full time, was painting or drawing what I actually saw versus what my mind thought I saw. Right. Okay. So that's a really critical piece of deep practice, Mm -hmm. especially for artists, is can you practice what you really see versus what your mind thinks you see? Yeah. And that's a tough one. For me, it's a tough one in color because I, you know, you look at the sky and everybody goes, oh, blue sky or green grass or, you know, we have these colors that are associated with very specific things. And all those colors are so affected by the environment around it, whether it's sunrise or sunset or cloudy day, super sunny day. And it changes those those colors, Mm -hmm. if you will, you know, and everything changes. And that's been the hardest thing for me to actually kind of wrap my head around with color. Um, And it's probably why I do more charcoal than I do color, because I have a tendency to get way into my head when I'm doing an oil painting and I'm working with color and charcoal, I tend to stay a lot more in my heart and in my body and just let things materialize, I think. But we are devolving into a completely different area. So I, I, what, what, what I want to get back to is kind of what we had, when we first talked about, about Robertson's and the violinist. I'd like Erickson. To know, Erickson and the violinist. I'd like to know 
I mean, and I think everybody else is probably wondering, well, what was the violence study and what were the results of the violence study? Okay, so the violence study was that he looked at hundreds of violinists, possibly thousands. I mean, because it's like he did several studies. And what he found, and this is, this is, he, these are his words. These are not mine. So mm. I'm actually reading from an editorial that he wrote in response to somebody else who kind of trashed his work. And what he said is that our main point was that the best group of violinists had spent significantly more hours practicing than the two groups of less accomplished expert violinists and vastly more time than amateur musicians. Mm -hmm. So there is no magic number. Mm -hmm. Now, you read to me at one time this kind of number thing that came from that study. Do you, do you still have that? It was like um, certain violinists spent Oh, yeah. 4, okay, so, cent. all right. So one of the things that he... Hmm. that he talked about was that he was he focused on studying people that started their practice in childhood mm -hmm. and then matured by age 20 okay when you listen to or read daniel coyle's book the talent code okay he talks about the fact that there are are waves as you develop motor skill when you're growing up where it becomes much easier to learn a lot very fast okay so my hesitancy is that I don't want anyone thinking that it's like well I didn't start when I was a kid so it's not going to happen for mm -hmm. me okay the waves continue until you're 30 and the nice thing at least according to um to coil and the talent code is that your brain until the time until the moment that you die until the moment that you pass five percent of your brain is always waiting to learn something new mm -hmm. so that never stops so if you're listening to this and you're past 30 but you really love to draw and you really want to improve and you and that's where your heart is guess what you still have 5% of your brain dedicated to learning something new. Or 5%, 5% of, I believe it's an oglocyte. It's a specific type of um, brain cell that focuses on wrapping myelin, mm -hmm. okay, which is how you learn. So I don't want, it's like when we talk about this, I don't want anybody to think it's like, well, I didn't start, with, I didn't start when I was a kid. Right. And it's like, no, please don't, please don't take that from this information. Mm-hmm. It's like you can accomplish this at any age. Right. At any age. So what he said was, is that the best group of violinists with estimated prospects for an international solo career, and this is Erickson speaking, had accumulated an average of over 10,000 hours by age 20. Okay. And I think of that in my, you know... My heart kind of drops because I go, oh, God, did I get that? I don't even think I got that. Right. You know, so that goes back to what you're saying as far as don't. Right, exactly. And then he points out that winners of international piano competitions continued full-time practice for many years beyond age 20 and thus accumulated around 25,000 hours at the time of their success. Okay. So it, it's like these numbers vary wildly. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no set number. What I take from Erickson's work, what I take from Daniel Coyle's book, The Talent Code, is that what's far more important is the type of practice that you're doing. How focused are you? How motivated are you? And how willing are you to make your practice uncomfortable mm -hmm. so or how willing are you to fail so you basically want to 
practice being comfortable being uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> which which I think is is um, when I think of something like that, I think it's something that I've I feel like I've only recently gotten to is that is is trusting that uncomfortableness. But even beyond that, trusting that I've put in the hours to find my way out of that uncomfortableness. And that's deep practice. Yeah. It's not crushing the paper and going, I suck. It's like, this is a problem. Got it. How am I going to get myself out? That's the deep practice. And and I feel like I've, I've, I've only reached the point where I feel I trust myself enough within, I'd say, the last year. And that, and that is only really associated with my charcoal and my drawing and my graphite pieces. It's not associated with my oil painting. So <clears throat> that brings up another whole different question. Is that is it 10,000 hours per sky? skill set so is it is it or or does it or or can you trans it's almost like you know can you can you move some of the knowledge over from your drawing into your oil painting and now you only need two thousand hours yes. to learn the extra okay i would say yes okay okay so that goes back to daniel coil and the talent code that basically what you're trying to do with your myelin is create as broad a scaffolding as possible okay okay and this goes back to also a concept that's known as cognitive reserve okay okay and cognitive reserve came about do you want me to talk about cognitive reserve yeah let's talk about cognitive okay. reserve. all right cognitive reserve came about uh back in the 80s when um these doctors were doing autopsies on people who had dedicated their brains to science and they were trying they were looking at um, they were looking at Alzheimer's disease, and they started finding these brains where the medical records showed no Alzheimer's disease, and yet their brains were riddled with it. Their brains were riddled with plaque, hmm. and it was like, okay, how come some people had this, and yet in their medical records there was no statement of, you know abnormal memory loss that would lead them to give them a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and why did some people have the same plaque but were given Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and what they realized through a lot of research is that it's based on what is known as cognitive reserve and it and it also it's not just Alzheimer's it also um, shows up with how people can recover from stroke and um, other Pre, other other brain issues and basically the broader the more you learn the more scaffolding you have in your brain so that if something goes wrong your brain can do a reroute and it can work around the injured part mm. so that way you can continue forward okay okay so <clears throat> one of the things that's really interesting about how do you build cognitive reserve it's the same way you do deep practice how comfortable can you be with uncomfortable learning, mm -hmm. right? Where you're struggling a little bit. That's what pushes your brain to build new scaffolding. Okay. Okay. So, for example, I've got eight things that you can do to improve your cognitive reserve. Let's leave that one for a new, okay. for a new, uh, new thing. I think we're about... 20 something minutes okay. and I don't want it to be too oh, I long. Guess, I guess I guess I made it a teaser. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to I want to get into cognitive disorder. I just really feel like it needs it, it needs its own episode cuz this really is talking what what I always call muscle memory. And motor memory. Right, motor memory, but I always have called it muscle, muscle memory. memory. Right. You know, it, and and everybody thinks about it when you golf or when you, you know, ride a motorcycle if you draw and it's 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 that so i'd like to spend a little more time diving deeper into that um so i kind of want to just circle back to the ten thousand hour rule so basically it you know the ten thousand hour rule really was just an average for and, and you're talking about violinists in that study that reached a world-class level right so not 
being an extremely good violinist, but we're talking a world class level. Mm -hmm. So even for artists, um, you could get into a professional level of work sooner. I don't even know how to say that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let go. So can we say that the 10,000 hour rule is a myth? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've busted the myth. Right. Okay, and what is far more important is the quality of practice you bring to every time you sit down and either take pencil to paper or brush to paint. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think, I think <clears throat> as an artist, you can move almost every piece you, you do into that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're not just going on on, uh, you know, I'm just cruising along, you know, in the sense that if you're doing a hand that you're actually looking for, for reference and you're studying that reference and you're drawing that reference, that, that, that's part of that 10,000 hour rule. You're pushing yourself faces doing the same thing. And so every drawing, every drawing that you do, if you're going out there and you're trying to find photo reference or using photo reference, you've just moved that from, from just doodling to being a focused practice piece, mm -hmm. and um, and I find that exciting because because yeah, that it's a lot easier to build your your time and your hours when when you when you know that when you know that just sitting in front of the sketchbook. You, you do realize you're very cute. You are very attached to ten thousand hour rule. You do realize that it's no. like building your hours, building your hours, and it's like just focus on the practice no and, and i get that but what i'm going back to is what like erickson said he, he didn't say he said like an average of ten thousand hours and and that um and and i guess where i'm going and the reason why I, I i'm kind of saying that and and i'm i'm emphasizing that is because on the other side of that coin um being an artist is a lot of work yeah you and have we, to do the work you got to do the work and you just can't deny how much work it takes to be a really good artist and i want to make sure that that in this that 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 also comes across is that it is that it can be daunting but that that being a daunting task is half the fun of being an artist that that realizing you can keep improving and improving and knowing that you can be as good as any of your any of the people that that you look up to i think is a super exciting thing but it all comes back to doing the work and so i look at ten thousand, and i go oh, that's a lot of work and i always say that but really what i'm saying is that i think that the, the thing that that does say is that it's it takes work mm -hmm. being a good artist mm -hmm. um takes a lot of work mm -hmm. and don't ever think that that it doesn't that that's the key if you ever wanted to know what is the key practice it's practice it's it's deliberate, deliberate or deep practice. That's the key. So there we go. We just gave you the key to being a great artist. <laughs> and I think we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> so anyhow, everybody, thank you so much for, for tuning in, if you will. I know that's old school. Nobody tunes in anymore on the radio. Hey, but, uh... I like tuning in. <laughs> thank you for listening. And uh, you guys take care. Yeah. Have a beautiful day, y'all. Thank you. Bye.